Alright, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to a very special extra video. After my monetary policy update video, I had a request for some information about the 2022-2023 budget. So we're going to do a little bit of a summary of all the relevant budgetary policy things for this year that have come out from the previous government, um, which may or may not come to fruition, but are able to be used on your overall exam. So when we get into this, it's going to be very important to note that you don't technically need to know anything about the new budget that's going to come out in October of this year. So you don't need to know the labor budget. So you don't need to know that. All right. And then what else is really important is that you can use any information from the past two years of budgets or any policy that has been influencing the economy in the last two years. So that two years is really, really important. Whenever you see that recent contemporary, anything like that, any policy that has come into effect or is still in effect over the last two years. So that means infrastructure projects which are still occurring, that is currently relevant. So like the Westgate Tunnel remains relevant because it's still being built. Job Seeker and Job Keeper were still a little bit relevant last year, so therefore you can still use them on the end of year exam. So still really, really important, still really relevant. Um, one other tip that I always give out is if you're using JobKeeper and JobSeeker, so if we look at Seeker and JobKeeper, try and keep them separate in terms of how you use them. JobSeeker, we tend to use as aggregate demand side, as it is a transfer payment that becomes an income for people and therefore impacts aggregate demand. Whereas JobKeeper is a wage subsidy and therefore is AS side because that is more of a wage subsidy that lowers the cost of production for businesses and therefore makes them more willing and able to produce. So then getting into some of the nitty gritty about the 2022-2023 budget. So first up, we've got the aggregates where we have the underlying cash balance that was predicted for this year is a deficit of $78 billion. Whether or not that happens is we're not sure. The labor budget is going to be a larger deficit than that because I think it is necessary for stimulating the economy, but that is the current underlying cash balance that they are predicting for this financial year. I also hope you're enjoying my random PowerPoint template that I've used here to try and make it look pretty. So then when we get into some specific policies, so some of the focus at the moment is on recovery from natural disasters. We've had a lot of floods, bushfires, etc. So a lot of the government spending is going towards those areas. So we've got 2.2 billion for households for income support, temporary accommodation and social services. Obviously that is going to increase consumption spending. So that is going to then increase consumption and therefore aggregate demand. 665 million to businesses, farmers for repairs, new equipment support and services. That is hopefully then going to make businesses more efficient or lower their cost of production because they're getting that assistance and therefore that should be favorable for our aggregate supply. So it can be used as an aggregate supply side policy. 589 million for community cleanup recovery, including 300 million for the emergency response fund and for recovery for post-disaster resilience initiatives. It's gonna be a lot of different things there. We just include that as government spending, which can therefore increase aggregate demand in that way. So then also over 6 billion on Queensland, New South Wales floods, 2.8 billion on bushfires, and 1.5 billion on North Queensland floods. So a lot of different spending there. Then we get into some specifically aggregate demand side policies. So a one-off cost of living tax offset. So they increased the low and middle income tax offset to $1,500 for 2022-2023. So obviously this means that at tax time, it's gonna increase the discretionary income of households, which can increase consumption spending and therefore increase aggregate demand. If you want to use this as an aggregate supply side policy, you can, because this effectively means that um, labor needs to pay less tax and that increases incentives to work and therefore can increase efficiency. As people are paying less tax, they're more willing and able to work and therefore that can increase aggregate supply. We've got a one-off cost of living payment for low income earners and those on um, who are pensioners, welfare recipients or veterans or eligible concession card holders. This is a payment of $250 that is tax exempt. Obviously that is increasing people's discretionary income, increasing consumption spending, increasing aggregate demand. Then obviously tying these things to various goals are gonna be important. They've got the tex temporary fuel excise relief. This can go in two ways. It's obviously gonna be an increase in cost, a decrease in cost of production for businesses and therefore 
improve our aggregate supply. However, for consumers, it's going to mean that they are have lower expenses. Um, also means the government's going to be collecting less tax. But in terms, it means there's going to be more money left over for consumption spending as fuel becomes less of an expense for households, and that can increase consumption spending and aggregate demand. Then to move on to a few more, we have from the aggregate supply side, a lot of different spending on infrastructure. So there's all kinds of projects here. Um, when you're talking about projects, infrastructure projects, when you're talking about for, you're talking around from aggregate demand side, you can just talk about them as government spending, increased government spending, gonna lead directly to increase in aggregate demand. But if you're talking about them for aggregate supply, it's all about the impact they have on the economy in the short and long term. So these infrastructure projects in the short term are gonna create employment um, and create production in the short term. In the long term, it's gonna make businesses more efficient as it's gonna lessen travel times and make things more effective and therefore make our aggregate supply greater overall. Um, with all these, it's, the word around is your friend. If you're ever trying to quote the amount that's being spent on these policies, the word around is you're gonna be your friend. So I always like to use Victorian projects as a Victorian because um, they are around us more, it's easier to remember them. So things like 920 million for the outer metropolitan ring rail south is a infrastructure project announced this year that is a relevant policy. Other things that can be considered aggregate supply is tax relief for small businesses, meaning they have more money to take on extra workers. So obviously that's gonna lower cost of production and increase aggregate supply. There um, is technological technolo technology investment boost. So the government's providing $1 billion for new technology investment. Um, obviously that's hoping that that's gonna increase efficiency or productivity and therefore increase aggregate supply. And skills and training booths. There is a 20% bonus deduction for eligible external training courses for upskilling employees. So that is going to lower cost production, but that should also increase productivity or efficiency as our businesses are incentivized to get their workers more skills and either way, that is gonna increase aggregate supply. So then, just a quick um, recap of some still relevant past examples. So like we said before, JobKeeper and JobSeeker. So JobSeeker and JobKeeper are still relevant and you can use them as examples which work really well as an aggregate demand, aggregate supply side tool. There's Job Trainer, which was a education and training um, aggregate supply side policy to give people skills in areas we have skill shortages. I still use the Westgate Tunnel project because it has been going for a long time as an infrastructure project. So these are great. You can also use the low middle income tax offset, the $1,080 that is being, um, has been in the past few years before it became 1,500 this year. So that $1,080 tax offset is still relevant. Uh, and then we've got things like decreasing business tax for small and medium sized businesses to 25%, it's also pretty useful to use. So there's a whole bunch of different examples. So hope they were useful to you. It's just a little bit of a nine minute summary of budgetary policy this year. There are a bunch of other videos about the previous budgets that have come out through COVID. If you wanna check those out, you totally can. I'm not the boss of you, you can do what you want. Um, if you are interested in getting more information like this and the whole year's curriculum summarized in a few hours, uh, feel free to head to the link below to go to my website and sign up to my revision lecture. Um, but other than that, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, ask me anything, um, share this video to your friends who are doing economics, unless you want to beat them, in which case don't share it because why would you do that? But other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.